Good morning, Anthem. We are excited to have another Sunday to worship with each and every one of you and to teach our lesson. Uh, we first want to say thank you to Brother Ethan who came this week um, and taught to our students about season of change on Wednesday night and what a timely and fitly message that was especially with our students embarking on a new challenge this year. Uh, some doing uh, total virtual learning and others are going in and uh, going partial seated classes and then uh, partial virtual learning. Uh, definitely gonna be uh, an experience of change and um, we will be praying for each and every one of you starting uh, in a week and a half from now. Um, we also uh, hope that all of you made it safely through the hurricane on Tuesday. Uh, the staff tried to reach out to each and every family member uh, of our youth uh, students and families to make sure you weathered the storm okay. If for any reason you did not receive our messages uh, and are in need of help, please reach out to us or to the church and we are more than happy to help. Um, this week we will be starting on wednesday uh, the five laws of dating relationship basically picking up where we left off right before the pandemic uh, so we'll be going through those series of lessons sister Risha will be starting the first lesson um, and i will be having uh, help from sister robin sister jessica and brother andrew and teaching uh, some of the other lessons. We are looking forward to tackling um, some of the questions and some of the wisdom that we need to impart to each and every young person as far as in dating relationships. Uh, this morning, we are gonna be talking about communion, the purpose uh, and uh, understanding the reason and the power of taking communion. And so uh, I'd like to start off with um, sharing my first time ever taking communion. I was probably about six or seven when that transpired. And I remember them talking about this morning is going to be communion service. And we will be uh, sharing uh, and partaking in the body of Christ and his blood. And I thought, what in the world are we doing? I do not want to drink anything that looks like red blood. And I do not want to eat anything that uh, is uh, flesh or body. And so in my mind, uh, we were eating uh, things that, wow, that's just crazy. Um, and then I learned that it was symbolic. And most of you probably discovered that too. Um, but uh, just the thought of drinking and eating something uh, that was bodily fluids did not sound appealing to me, whether it was good or not. Um, but today we're going to talk about communion and what it represents and the purpose. And uh, you may have your own story of uh, what communion was like for you the first time. Maybe you were uh, young and elementary or maybe you were middle school or high school doing it for the first time and I'm sure everybody has their own experience um, and take on communion. Jesus knew that his time on earth was coming to an end and uh, his preparation uh, and the, the segue to uh, the crucifixion he knew was coming and approaching very quickly. So he got all of his disciples and followers together and he took them to a house and they sat around a dinner table, what we would call the Last Supper. And his way of illustrating to them about his crucifixion was through uh, food and through drink. He felt like this was the best way he could explain it to them. And so he told them uh, basically that the time had come and his ministry on earth was over and that here soon the Romans would come and they would take him and they would beat him and they would crucify him on the cross and his blood would be shed 
for their sins and also the sins of the world. And so he said, I want you as the last meal that we share together, I want you to partake of my body, which will be broken for you. And I want you to drink of this drink, which will symbolize the blood that I will shed for you. And so he broke the bread and he passed it around and he um, poured the wine or grape juice and he passed it around and he told them to take partake of that. This was also um, portrayed many years ago prior to this particular event um, back in the Old Testament where an innocent lamb was shed and the blood was posted on the doorpost of the children of Israel, so the angel of death would pass over them. Um, the meal that the Israelites partook of was of bitter herbs and um, flatbread. Uh, and again, this was another symbolic um, meaning or representation of the crucifixion and bondage that they were going to be set free from. Um, so Jesus basically showed in the Old Testament and the New Testament uh, his ministry and the reason uh, for the Passover, the reason for communion. Um, he said, do this in remembrance of me because he knew that... Um, we would possibly forget the cross, what was done. But if we, if we partake in communion, it's a remembrance. It's, it's a memory that will be brought back of why he went to the cross. He went to the cross for you and for me. And this is a ceremony or a ritual that we do that we don't do every single service that we get together. Um, it's something that we do possibly yearly. It may be once or twice a year, maybe three times, but it's not something that we do every single service. Um, when we think about communion, it's a time that we reflect inwardly, that we look inside of our hearts, if you will, look inside our, our, our motives, our behaviors, and we begin to reflect. Sometimes people are fearful to take communion because Paul warned that it was, uh, uh, if we take it unworthily, it's damnation to, to us. And so sometimes people are hesitant to take communion. Um, but we must take a look inside. We must uh, repent. Communion calls for a time of repentance. And repentance, it's really not hard. It's basically turning in the right direction toward God and leaving our selfish desires and ambitions behind. Uh, communion is not perfection. Uh, Jesus Christ knows that we are human and um, that we make mistakes and so he offers forgiveness and it's free to us all we have to do is ask for forgiveness so if we measure ourselves against some artificial standards of perfection then we're wrong you know uh, we got to realize that God made us uh, flesh and so um, we're going to fail. And so first, when we take communion, we have to look inward and we need to ask for forgiveness. We need to repent. Um, when we talk about communion, uh, in the original language, it describes a relationship. It, re it, re it reminds us of a fellowship. It reminds us that it's communion. When we talk about communion, we talk about communication. It's a relationship. It's fellowship. And so in a relationship, sometimes we, um, it's a give and take. It's, it's sacrifice. It's 
Sometimes we give gifts and sometimes we receive gifts. It's a deep sense of serving one another. It describes um, love in the deepest and the purest form. Um, Jesus had a simple plan. He desired fellowship with the Lord and he communed with him and God's plan is that we love one another. It says he loved us so much that he laid his life down for you and I. Jesus declared others would know we are his disciples because we are loving one another. The deepest commitment or the deepest fellowship um, that we can have is loving one another. And so um, we have to love like he loves. When we think about communion, communion reminds us as a church, we have to live in the in-between. So um, we are in the in-between right now. We were created in the beginning and we haven't been raptured yet. So right now we're living in the in-between. Um, some of the very last words that Jesus prayed or offered on the behalf of those who were following, he prayed to his disciples one day that um, we would behold his glory. The blessing of being in the church, it's wonderful. Yet the blessing of heaven is going to be even greater when we can live with him for eternity. Our fellowship with the Lord and each other in communion can most closely be anticipated when we repair, prepare for his return. We will gain a clear sense when we visit a service from end uh from the end of the century basically knowing that there's a purpose in this life there's a reason why we suffer there's a reason why there's sacrifice there's a reason why there's pain and suffering when we look forward we have something to look forward to when we take communion it's forgiveness of sin so that we can get to uh the other side when we partake in communion it involves all of our senses we are able to taste the broken bread. We are able to touch it. We're able to smell. We're able to hear the words that the minister um, tells us about. We're able to even drink and partake of the, um, the Lord's blood, if you will. These elements joining together um, requires worship. These are physical things that take place. There are also mental things that take place and there's also spiritual things that take place when we partake in communion. We reflect on the love that came down from the cross. He did all of that for us. He suffered all of that pain for us. Genuine love is gonna cost something. It cost Jesus everything. Jesus did not die for those who deserved it. He died for sinners like you and me. I wasn't perfect, you're not perfect. He doesn't expect us to be. Jesus also does not stop forgiving when somebody fails. Just because you have made a mistake this week or next week or the week after next, he's not going to say, this is it, I've written you off. No, the love of Christ is renewed daily for us. In 1 Corinthians chapter 13, it's the chapter, it's considered the love chapter. Love never fails. Even when we cannot get along with someone, love is kind. It doesn't brag. It doesn't keep score. Jesus was living example of this giving himself for an imperfect man or humanity who would fail him more than once but he was willing to do it for you and for me the church the body of christ was built on love love that is the super glue to the new testament we have to love like jesus loved he loved so great. 
He loved unconditionally. Jesus prayed for you and for me. And while his disciples le uh, slept that day in Gethsemane, he was up praying for you and for me. When he woke them up, they saw danger. They saw the Roman soldiers surrounding him. By the time Jesus was arrested, he stood alone. But Jesus never stopped loving. He greeted Judas, if you remember, with a kiss. Uh, our, our Judas greeted Jesus with a kiss. But Judas was Jesus' friend. He reached out to both Pilate and Peter. That's the loving God that we know. He even loved the Roman soldiers who mocked him. He healed the Roman soldier's ear who chopped off um, uh, where Peter chopped off his ear. He healed the Roman soldier, even though the Roman soldier was arresting him and, and taking him to the cross. That's how much Jesus loved. Ultimately, it is this act, the greatest simple act of love in the universe that we remember as we take communion. It is a representation of, of what Jesus did for us at the cross. He removed our sins, he forgave us, but most of all, he showed us the unconditional love that he had for you and I, those who would spit on him, who would turn their back on him, who would accuse him falsely, but he loved us. For this reason, we are re compelled to reflect when we partake of the Lord's Supper. Look, uh, suffering and, and his supper and his communion. Looking inward, looking outward, looking forward, looking backward to celebrate who Jesus is and what he did for us. That is why we take communion and that is why it is very important. So as I close this morning, communion is something we take part of in order to remember all that Jesus did and he gave for you and I. This is not something that we take lightly, but it's something that every Christian should make a part of their spiritual experience because his love is great and we should remember, just like we memorialize um, our family members that have passed on, we may go to a grave site, we may lay flowers, we may reflect and remember the memories that they made with us when we take communion, that's basically what we're, we are memorializing. What he did for us on the cross so that we will never forget that his love was so great for us. So as we close, Father, we thank you for what you did on the cross for, for all of us. We owed a debt that we could not pay. You paid a debt that you did not owe, but it was all because of love. It was love that kept you there because you could have called 10,000 angels to come down and rescue you that day, but you chose to stay there to die because you loved us that much. So Father, every time that we take communion, help us to remember it was your flesh that was whipped at the whipping post. It was your side that was pierced and blood poured out. It was your forehead or your brow that they pressed the crown of thorns into and it caused excruciating pain and great drops of blood fell from your forehead. It was your nail, your hands that were nailed and your feet that were nailed to a cross that was pierced for my sins, for all of our sins. And Father, we will remember as we partake in communion each time around Easter, around Christmas, and other times that we choose to remember and to reflect. Thank you for forgiving us of our sins, past, and future sins that we will commit. We thank you for your love and your mercy because it was your mercy that spared us to death. 
that was so rightly ours. We thank you that you died on the cross so that we can spend eternity with you. We don't have to die a spiritual death, but we can live on with you. This flesh may die, but our spirit will live on because of what you did at Calvary. We thank you and we praise you today. And it's in Jesus' name that we pray. We love each and every one of you. We pray that you enjoy your last week of summer vacation and that everybody will be ready to go in a week and a half from now when we start um, back to school on the 17th. Lord bless you.